Welcome to IB Physics SL Topic 7, Atomic and Nuclear Physics. Uh, in this first video, we're going to look at three models of the atom and how electrons play into the atomic model. First will be a Thomson's plum pudding model. Then Rutherford came along, and he came up with the idea that there's a positive nucleus at the center. Uh, and then we'll look at Bohr, who said there are these orbitals, energy levels, which electrons can occupy. After that, we will briefly touch on what is currently accepted in physics, which is this notion of probability waves. Probability waves. And that is a weird idea. We'll study it in greater detail in option B. But first, I want to introduce it here so we're more familiarized with the weirdness, so we can accept the weirdness. OK, here we have plum pudding. Plum pudding is made up of some you know, gelatin-like pudding. And then interspersed throughout are these plum pieces. So that's what this is. The atom <coughs> is like plum pudding. We have negative electrons, the plums, floating around in the positive pudding. And that positive pudding is equally distributed throughout the atom. This was developed in 80, uh, 1897. And it was kind of disproved big time. This plum pudding model took a huge hit. Uh, it was discarded in 1909 when Geiger and Marsden conducted the famous Geiger and Marsden experiment. You might be thinking, if this is such an, a famous experiment, why haven't I heard of it? Well, you have. It's also called the Rutherford experiment, or the Goldfoil experiment. But in IB physics, we call it the Geiger and Marsden experiment. They were, uh, I, let's see, I believe doctoral students, or just uh, researchers working under Rutherford. So what's the experiment, this famous experiment? Well, first let me introduce an alpha particle, which is a small positive particle made up of two protons and two neutrons. So if there's two protons with no electrons, then the net charge of the particle is plus 2e, where e is the elementary charge. Gold foil. Now, a gold foil is like uh, it's like tin foil, okay? Think of tin foil but made of gold. Also, gold foil is super thin, very very thin sheet of gold. So, here's what Geiger and Marsden did under the direction of Rutherford. They took a an alpha gun, and they fired away really high speed alpha particles at a gold foil. Okay? And they put screens behind it and around so they could detect where the alpha particles go after colliding with the gold foil. And what they did then is they took this uh, alpha gun, they fired away really high speed alpha, alpha particles, and what did they expect? Well, they expected the same thing to happen if you take, you know, a BB gun and you shoot it at, like, tissue paper. Really, really high-speed BB bullet pellets, BBs, will just go flying through the tissue paper. They'll break it and pass straight through, pretty much undeflected. So that's our prediction, okay? Now, you might be thinking, positive alpha particles will collide with this atom, and because positive is repelled by positive, then they'll get pushed around a little bit, right? Well, actually what would happen is, there's an, since there's an equal distribution of charge throughout the uh, atom, at least that's what Thomson thought, equally distributed positive charge, there wouldn't be any big net deflection, because the alpha particles will come through and kind of be pushed in all directions, and all those pushes will cancel out because of the, uh, the equal distribution of charge in his modeled atom. So, yes, in fact, they would pretty much pass straight through like this with no or minimal deflection. But what happened? Well, they fired away, and most of the alpha particles went straight through, undeflected or minim minimally deflected. But some of these alpha particles were deflected at quite large angles, right? You could measure this angle. And in fact, even more shocking, some bounced back off of the gold foil. And that was shocking because these are high-speed alpha particles. It's like shooting a gun at tissue paper and having the gun come back and hit you in the face. Because the alpha particles went in all these different directions at all these different deflected angles, sometimes we call it alpha scattering. This is an example of alpha scattering, this experiment, because they've scattered. Now, here's how we draw these angles. If uh, an alpha particle comes in like this, it comes along this path, well, it approaches the gold, and then it gets pushed away, deflected off like this. Right? To draw the angle itself, 
we extend the straight line of its original path, and then we find the straight line of its final path, and we extend that back to this line, and we measure the angle here, d for deflection angle. And you see that if the alpha goes forward and then bounces back like this, which is shocking, that's a deflection angle of more than 90 degrees. In fact, that's an, a 180 degree deflection where it goes and then bounces back. We could measure the angle as 180 here. Um, <coughs> so what we can conclude, what can we conclude? Well, if the alpha is coming along like this and then gets pushed away, repelled, there must be some dense positive charge somewhere down here repelling that positive alpha from its original path. And likewise, if it's coming forward and then bouncing off, there must be some really dense, really, really dense positive charge right here causing it to bounce away. What we now know is that these positive charges are called the nucleus. Right? And I just wanted to show you you might think, uh, well, here's another example of a deflection angle of greater than 90 degrees, but less than 180. It's where it comes over and then bounces off like that. Right? That's another example of the kinds of high deflection angles they saw in the experiment. Here's a great quote from Rutherford talking about this, you know, bouncing back. He said, it was quite the most incredible event that has ever happened to me in my life. It was almost as incredible as if you fired a 15-inch shell or a bullet, at a piece of tissue paper, and it came back and hit you. On consideration, I realized that this must be the result of a... On consideration, I realized that this must be the result of a single collision. And when I made the calculations, I saw it was impossible to get anything of that order of magnitude unless you took a system in which the greater part of the mass of the atom was all concentrated in a minute nucleus. It was then that I had the idea of an atom with a minute massive center carrying a positive charge. Right. So this is what we can uh, conclude, and you know, this is how we summarize the experiment itself. We expect alphas to pass through minimally or undeflected. We witnessed most doing what the expectation was, but some bounced back off the foil, 180 degree deflection angle, and a few passed through, but they were heavily deflected, and so a few alpha particles bounced back, and some had really high deflections. But the most shocking was the greater than 90 degree deflection angles, right? Where they bounce all the way back, where they bounce off into an angle. That was the most shocking. Um, and here is the conclusion, what, here's what we can draw. These huge deflections provide evidence that the positive charge occupies a small, dense, heavy region. In other words, all of the positive charge in the atom is located in one dense spot. It's not spread throughout like pudding, as Thompson thought. So a few electrons were highly deflected because they came close to that small, uh, dense positive charge. Because all of the atom's mass is in a small, dense region, most of the atom is empty space, which means that most alphas pass through empty space. They're nowhere near the small dense positive charge, and so they're undeflected as they pass through. This model is wrong. The positive charge is not distributed evenly throughout the atom like this. That's wrong. Uh, and I should have it a much bigger picture. Instead, what we say is that we have, oh, let me pull my screen down. We say we have a positive nucleus, and then scattered around are these electrons. Okay, and most of the atom is just empty space. So here's the Rutherford model. The positive charge in the atom is located in a small, heavy, dense nucleus surrounded by negatively charged electrons, and the atom is mostly empty space. So this positive nucleus is really dense and really heavy because all of that positive charge, all of that mass, is at this one spot all of the mass, almost, and all of the positive charge, definitely all of it, and most of the mass is here, dense. Now, in 1913, Niels Bohr built on this model by saying, kind of pinpointing what the electrons are doing in the atom. So he focused on electrons. He said that the electrons, he thought, were in orbit, circularly, circularly accelerating, right, moving in a circle, just like planets orbit the sun. But we know that Every object moving in a circle has a centripetal force, 
So for Bohr, he said the centripetal force keeping the electrons in orbit was the electrostatic attraction between the negative electrons and the positive nucleus at the core. Now, the term electrostatic doesn't mean that the charges themselves are stationary. We can understand that to mean that it's the type of attraction experienced by stationary charges. So we could imagine maybe there are other attractions, there are other fields produced by moving charges, right? The magnetic field is produced by a moving charge. And what we are discussing here is the electrostatic forces, not magnetic forces, nothing produced by moving charges, but the, uh, the, the attraction is the same as the attraction felt by stationary charges. So here's Bohr's picture, okay? There are these uh, orbitals, or excuse me, energy levels, right, which we can represent as circles where the electron orbits. So the electron could be orbiting here at this first n1 energy level, or it could be at the energy level n equal to 2, right, e2, or it could be here at this third energy level. But the bigger the orbit, the greater the electron's energy, right? So if we give the electron energy, it gets farther from the nucleus. In fact, if we give the electron enough energy, it will break away altogether from the nucleus and the atom will become ionized. Okay. But here's the strange thing about Bohr's model. He said the electrons are only ever in these orbitals, these energy levels. Right? In other words, it's able to move from orbital to orbital, but it cannot be between two orbitals. It's never in this space between orbitals. So you might be thinking, how is this? How does this happen? Well, this is kind of where the term quantum leap came about. The electron is right here, and then it leaps from here to here without ever passing between the space in between. There's a quantum leap. Quantum just means it's uh, of a really, really, really small scale where the world acts differently. So that was Bohr's idea. Now, <clears throat> we know then that if an electron is to drop to a lower, lower orbit, a lower orbital, then by definition, the electron is losing energy, because this is the high, higher energy, the next n equals 2 is a lower energy, and n equals 1 is where the electron has the lowest energy. So if it drops to a low, lower orbit, it loses energy. But energy is conserved. It can't just be lost it can only be converted between forms. So where does the energy go? What is it converted to? Well, as we know now, the energy is converted into light. When an electron transitions to a lower orbital, the electron emits electromagnetic radiation. It sends off light. Okay? And this has to do, this is something, this has to do with why, you know, things like fire produce light. Now, what Bohr said is he used an idea from Einstein. He said that the frequency of that light which is emitted is proportional to the energy of the emitted light, like this. So the electron falls down to this lower energy level. It's just lost some energy by definition of what these energy levels are. So it sends off light. Light is emitted. And that light has a frequency. And the change in energy between the two levels is equal to h times f. So what is h? Well, h is just the proportionality constant in this relationship. It's a universal constant that never changes, and it's called Planck's constant. So here's the value. There are the units. Incredibly small. But this is a very, very special equation. Okay, And in fact, Bohr wasn't the first to write this equation. Planck was. And Einstein really talked about this equation. But here's what this equation says. It says that light is emitted from this electron, and that the light, which is emitted, comes in a packet of energy. There is a defined energy packet for the light, right? So the light has some frequency. It's sent off. It's a wave, we think. But that wave comes in an energy packet. And here is the amount of that energy packet. It's calculated using this equation. So already we're starting to see that light kind of acts like packets, and that sort of means light is in a way a wave, uh, excuse me, a particle, as well as being a wave. So we'll discuss this more in a later unit. 
So this equation, right, it says that if we transition from n equal to 5 to n equal to 2, well, you just plug in E5 minus E2, and that's equal to H times the frequency of emitted light. So if we have big jumps, we'll have bigger delta E values, because the higher N value you get, the higher energy level, the higher the energy. Right? E6 is really, really big. E1 is the smallest energy level. So from E6 to E1 is a huge delta E value. As this delta E increases, though, so does the frequency of light emitted. And blue or purple light is the highest energy light, which means it's also the highest energy of, uh, it's the highest delta E value. So if you see, for example, a flame, and it's a blue flame, then that blue light indicates that there are big energy jumps occurring.